major movement in 20th century and phenomenology is pretty deep when considered to the other movements because the word it, it, this particular uh, uh, movement started in the 20th century so when you understand 20th century 20th century was much liberal you have liberalism in place and you have people taking courage to talk about any kind of topic we have gender topics we have people talking about their roles in society we have people talking about their status in society we have people talking about all what they need to tell the world so the major movement in the 20th century was derived from the greek verb pheno which means to bring light pheno phenomenal so when you bring light to make something appear to bring light to something so that it is it appears into the vision of a person and the literary meaning of it is a science of appearances so if you are a person who loves to uh, write what you feel what you see what you what you imagine as appearances or a glimpses of something that is um, out of your imagination then phenomenology is one major moment of the 20th century that paved way for it and the german philosopher johann hendrik lambert uh, he and um, he had brought in this idea of um, phenomenology into psychology and it was considered to be a science of illusions the science of people um a science of understanding the human mind with all its illusions and imaginations and immanuel kant in his nat in his work uh, natural philosophy in the year he lived in the year 19 uh, 1724 to 1804 in his natural philosophy he talks about the realm of appearance he tries to talk about the appearance and how it um, plays a major role in human mind and these particular people who supported this movement they believed of things as they are for example if they saw a ghostly appearance they just believed it as it is and they tried to inculcate that in their work so to be very clear about it they tried to talk about phenomenology of experiences and consciousness how the human mind things and elaborates its idea and the most important part of phenomenology it is uh, very subjective it is a personal appearance for example you might have a different vision when you see something and i might have a different vision when i see something so for example we are seeing a place where a lot of kids are playing around i might have an idea of the picture of the heaven where people uh, have are very happy and joyous whereas you will find it as as an image of responsibility how the next generation is all happy not knowing about the hazard it's things around so the perceptions of the human mind and how experience plays a very important role is what this phenomenologist or the people who founded this particular movement uh, focused upon and it was founded by this person uh, rather to say founded it was um you universalized by this person called edmund herzel and he was from germany and it went into france and france and other places like the united states and it was not a unified movement that was not a particular group where people sat together discussed and brought it to the world no they were different authors they were different people who shared a common thought who shared that experience truth as it is is exactly what we need to know and though they had a common thought they had their differences uh, i would say they were most a uh, contradicting at the same time comprehensive kind of people who could come together with a common thought with their own differences and they had appearance of ideas through act of consciousness they knew exactly what they were writing they knew that it was from the mind unfiltered onto a work of art and they also started to write objective study of topics for example uh, they they did not want to think about uh, what the other people thought they just wanted to bring uh, to the society how it how they felt the world to be and it was included judgments it include included perceptions and emotions and to remind you that in the late 20th century criticism played a very major role and after phenomenology you had people you had a lot of other uh, movements like the reader response reception theory reception based theories that were a part of this phenomenology and its movements so the types of phenomenology can be uh, it can be categorized into seven which is not it's not very uh, you know crazy to think about this it's very simple so when you categorize phenomenology into seven parts they include transcendental constitutive phenomenology where a person thinks above their ideas for example 
um if you are an overthinker transcendental philosophy or phenomenology would be so relatable we think of extremes it can be extreme happiness it can be extreme sadness it can be extreme fear so when you think about that and you try to give a fantasy to it for example you bring a lot of fantastical elements now transcendental constitutive phenomenology can be seen in the works of jk rowling and uh, jk rowling in harry potter harry potter or you can see the game of thrones where you transcend your ideas from the human ideas but you have a historical element to it and you constitute the human brain and its imagination and you bring it to uh, appearance as it is in your mind that is called as transcendental constitutive phenomenology the next one is naturalistic constitutive phenomenology of being in the same contemporary world when you constitute naturalistic elements um Uh, for example when you think of the movie life of pi by jan martel it's a beautiful example of naturalistic constitutive phenomenology because naturally you will find a person journeying getting lost in the sea but finding discovering a new land new island even now we hear a lot of uh, news newspaper scapes where you find new islands which are which have a new different habitat so naturalistic constitutive something that you can believe in and that is appearing as it is from a writer's or uh, uh, an author's point of view existential phenomenology is a beautiful thing again where it talks about where the idea of the writer has its own as existential basis for example albert camus writings have an existential phenomenology where you do not know where the whole story is heading into but it's exactly what is going through the character's mind nothingness numbness is again example of albert camus um you know presentation of existential phenomenology and generative historic uh, historicist phenomenology is where you talk like movies like bahubali where you talk about historic ideas and then you inculcate ideas where it could have been like this it could have been like that in order to tell the audience that there were kings and queens who ruled the world and it could have been a better constitution it could have better been it could have been a better land so there are people who um, and now when you see the amazon river basis it has a it has it has a beautiful history to it where generative historic phenomenology comes through um anthropologists who've written about life that has been in the forest and how during the smallpox the entire um what do you call that the entire race was um wiped away from the earth so they talked about generative historic phenomenology life as it is how it is seen and perceived though it is imagination or illusion it is presented through history genetic phenomenology uh this is a bit more psychological but it has something to do with the human mind there are many people who have written about how their parents had an impact on them for example when you take um um i'm not getting the correct person um okay i i'll just give a random example uh let's take wordsworth himself uh, when he talks about the solitary reaper and he talks about the admiration of poetry maybe there would have been people in his own genetic cycle who would have admired nature you never know and then you also have people um, uh, you have writers who've got genetically imbibed structures ideas in them um where they they have the admiration towards uh, literature for for example um i'm i'm not getting the writer okay let's go to hermeneutic and when i when i get that person's name in my head i'll just tell it to you the hermeneutic uh, phenomenology it it basically symbolizes words and its meanings and how it is referred to through the uh, writer's point of view through symbols ideas and everything how it is related to that person's perceiving ability and the next one is realistic phenomenology most pheno phen phenomenology where most of the time we dream dreams that are real life like and when we try to pictureize that into paper we understand that you know it's too realistic we we share to people saying that you know it was so real life like okay yeah i got genetic phenomenology the example is charles lamb's stories he has his genetic inhibitions of 
uh, growth so that whenever he wrote he wrote about the emotional imbalances of human mind he knew that his family had a great downfall he lost a lot of loved ones and that kind of reflected in his writing so these people who are phenomenologists they try to bring significance to the mind or the psyche of the human uh, thought so there are some divisions in it one is intentionality when you intend to do something for example you have a uh, you know the definition that i've given here is the notion that conscious is always a conscious of something when i intend to do something good so the writer when he wants to intend to tell the reader that this is what i want to tell this is how i want to save the world that is intentional intentionality under phenomenology and it is a stretching out towards the object it's more like empathizing or understanding another person like the dead soldiers uh, the war struck in world where they intentionally try to express what they feel next one is intuition intuition is nothing but having something in front of you or in your imagination and it is an object that is intuited you feel like something is going to happen you feel like this is what is going to happen so when t s eliot wrote that the wasteland is going to be a dystopian world he intuited that if the world is going to be war stricken like this it's going to end into a dystopian world the same time when people wrote utopian literature they intuited that if we are going to help each other it is going to be a utopian world so that is how literature and intuition works and though the direct there's the object is intuited directly or indirectly or even if it is empty just a thought that is prevalent in the writer's uh, mind uh, in phenomenology this is how it is presented then the next one is evidence when you see something as a subject of achievement of truth now if you see a lot of um, sherlock holmes book it is phenomenology because they go in search of evidence can you prove it is there a subjectivity of achievement of truth so all these stories that imbibed um, in search of the achievement of truth would have been the after effects of phenomenology when when it came or creeped into or took its root into literature so the whole idea was can you prove it can you prove that this is exactly what happened then it is evidence through phenomenology and the next very important this one is uh, noises and noema these are two terms when it might come you might come across this in your exams noetic it refers to the intentional act of consciousness for example i believe to do something like the idea of manifestation you believe to accept something you believe to understand something you are willing to accept something that is called as noetic and noematic is nothing but you refer to an object or a content where you 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 believe that it was something for example you believed it to be adventurous but it it was not so so every time you step into water it scares you because once when you stepped into water it it would have been a drastic problem that happened you would have got you know you would have sunk into it or you would have lost a loved one every time you come across that object or reference or content you have something that appears in your mind so that is called as nomadic so noetic and nomadic are two ideas that are that were fundamentalist uh, ideas of the phenomenologist and empathy and intersubjectivity empathy is nothing but you experience your body and you stretch out your ideas to another person so when you take characters like the english patient you have hanna the character who excuse me who plays the character of the nurse uh, she tries to em empathize with the character the english patient and he, she tries to empathize empathize with that person transcending from her body and trying to save the other character so empathy and intersubjectivity was one prevalent um, idea that was imposed by the phenomenologists and the experience of one's body and to another person so it's more like empathy you stretch out to somebody and help them the same thing was done in literature where ideas of characters for example tony morrison's beloved when the character beloved him herself tries to understand or a color purple if you take the characters tries to empathize with the other people though they are of the different race they try to empathize themselves or if you take uh, the um uh, margaret atwood's uh, work when you see margaret atwood's work you see the surfacing itself it talks about the pain of a woman it talks about or if you take margaret atwood's another work is handmade tale it 
tries to em help the reader empathize and understand the intersubjectivity how each character has become oneself with it so this again is an after effect of reader response theory and how we as a reader could connect to the uh, characters that were written by the writer so now phenomenology would would you it's is a is an idea that is there within the psyche of a human being and the next one is life world world according to each one of us uh, according to phenomenologists that each world is different for each one of us for example dr psyche himself he would have a perception of the world in a very different way his background of the world would be different his horizon of experience would be much more than all of us and his ideas of learning and literature would be much more liberal and much more um, experience based than each one of us and we would have experience in a different tonality to it or uh, bayanka who is here listening to it or nidhi who is listening to it you have a life world that is going to be totally different from other people and that according to phenomenologists is very important when you write because you have to present life world world as your background as how you experience it for example the tree of life when you when you take patrick white's tree of life is an australian writer many tries to tell the world that you know this is how my land is or when you talk about shashi tarur's uh, uh, idea of um, you know how why am i why why am i a hindu he tries to explain himself in his own way of world how he was brought up in the world or you take sudhamurthy's writing which is again the most modern writers they try to depict the world as it is or rk narayan when he's talking about swami and his friends he tries to say world or life world exactly like how it is so if you are reading all these places where they bring life world from their experiences and bringing the background of their life and horizon thanks to the phenomenologists of the 19th century because they were the ones who initiated that life has to be reflected through one's point of view and it can be objective at the same time and phenomenologists like i told you the german philosopher edmund husserl and the other like you know prominent right, um, philosophers included martin heidegger Maurice Merleau Ponty John Paul Sartre John Paul Sartre would have been a very important figure many people would have come across him especially when it comes to knowledge of phenomenology where you take to take ideas and you have also Alfred Schuth all these people are basically german polish based but uh, when you think of the world literature as such they had the highest um, a uh, hang on literature especially when it came comes to expressing one's own ideas and as i told you ideas as the experience as they appear in one's own minds and thought that is presented in phenomenology and they after phenomenology there were two uh, schools that were born out of this one is the geneva school of critics and the next one is the reception theory so the geneva school of critics what they did was they analyzed how people thought about different ideas and they compartmentalized it in under psychology and reception theory is nothing but reader response theory that we uh, learn in one of the schools and movements in literature and phenomenology though it was launched by edmund husserl in his uh, in his book called logical investigations in the year 1900 to 1901 it is a debate of how human experience can be brought into a purely private and internal sphere of experience and yet give the world how it is um, portrayed by the writer or the artist and in an experience that is it actually had to be totally private for example when virginia woolf told about uh, the room of one's own she wanted to tell the world that this is my private space but at the same time it was to the world to say that many women out there would feel the same way like i feel when uh, when you have um, andrew marvel talking about the sky mistress that again can come under the experience of privateness he wants to talk about a sky mistress but he wants to tell the world that this is what i expect from my mistress so this is what i express from my uh, expect from my beloved now like that you have a lot of literature for example um, the cherry orchard uh, it, it's it's uh, if i'm not wrong uh, cherry orchard mm, i'm not getting the name of the person um yeah okay it it talks about you know sophisticated family and their internal uh, discussions and all these you also have louis parnellos um uh, the characters in search of the author this is all the characters in search of the author where it's a private space of the writer where he wants to tell the world how he thinks or how she thinks 
Uh, so when you talk about gender, when you talk about feminism, you find that there is a lot of phenomenologist aspect to it, where the private space and ideas were given to the world. And it's it should be so totally separated from their uh, individual being and it should be given life and there was independence of language when they wrote it when they gave it a structure when they gave it a character it was totally independent of language they they gave it a, a firm structure to it uh, so uh, that's the end of my presentation uh, dr saikit yes uh Thank you for a very scholarly and enriching experience of this uh, later, uh, later uh, phase of Victorian age, these movements and schools of thought. And uh, as I said, when there was a small technical glitch and interruption due to the technical glitch that we thoroughly enjoyed your lecture, uh, we really feel, I personally enjoy young, I, I really enjoy when young teachers come and the energy and exuberance they display and uh, the kind of uh, knowledge storehouses now they that they are uh, you know uh, building up within themselves it is very heartening for people like me uh, to see that our world of english literature uh, is in safe hands so uh, words are not enough to thank you you have thoroughly delivered a very enriching very scholarly very in-depth and very, uh, you know, with, with apt examples. That's most important. Your pedagogical skills, I would like to really uh, admire and thank you for uh, showing this kind of pedagogy, which is the need of the hour. And uh, uh, with this thought only, uh, these lecture series are being organized so that, uh, you know, uh, students from rural or semi-rural or small places they are exposed to good teachers, to good pedagogical skills, so that what they experience in their schools and colleges, and of course, it, it goes without saying what kind of colleges and what kind of teachers generally we have in rural or semi-urban areas, uh, it gives them that hope, you know, that they have taken the right subject, they are going on the right path. And this is a subject which is uh, not only a subject, it's basically a companion throughout your life who is there with you during your, uh, you know, during your various phases of life. So thank you very much. Uh, it was really an amazing presentation. We, we'll, I, I enjoyed it. The participants thoroughly enjoyed it. You can see in the chat box, uh, they are appreciating, uh, of course, your content, your examples, your pedagogy. And uh, there are people from your place, Tamil Nadu, I think uh, there are people, I mean, this lecture series is a pan-India one. Our platform is very pan-Indian. So uh, I first saw a comment uh, from one of, uh, one of she basically teaching in one of the colleges, I think in Tamil Nadu, is called uh, uh, Raja Palayam Raju's College, which is in Raja Palayam in Tamil Nadu. And uh, she's teaching there and uh, she's very, very thankful, Ms. Deepa PV and uh, she's very thankful and uh, uh, she appreciates your amazing uh, skills of pedagogy and your research in short uh, you can read her message uh, she has written a long message of appreciation thank you deepa ji i hope you have enjoyed i hope all the participants enjoyed i put it in the telegram group as well that you know these lectures shouldn't be missed it's a sin to miss these lectures as per my understanding of being a scholar of literature. Yeah, I'd uh, like to add a point there because many people uh, feel that, you know, literature is deteriorating its power in the world. But let me tell you, literature is so-called of aesthetics of just the text and interpretation is over. Now, literature is gone into science. And like I always tell my students, there will be a time when you will talk about literature of science, of, um, you know, literature of... Uh, aerospace uh, dynamics you talk about metaphysics you will talk about launching in space and mars you will have martian literature very soon coming in so i think you know embracing literature on all these aspects including science including data entry including content writing it is something that is open to the world and we should take pride that as people who are aesthetically pleasing and who love literature we have taken all the subjects and to, and in, inside one banner called literature. So that includes physics, chemistry, biology, math, and science. 
so you don't have to be scared about math because what we are talking about sentence of meter and structure is exactly what we learning in mathematics as well so i think we imbibe all the studies and uh, sir if if you if you may can i answer the questions uh, which is there in the chat box yeah please uh, first yeah. comes uh, the i think uh, krishna agarwal's question and our question is the difference between subjective and objective approach of literature yes uh, so if, from the chat box i'll just start uh, deepa thank you so much i'm happy that it helped you i wish you success in all your endeavors and i wish you success in your journey of academics as well uh, krishna krishna agarwal uh, good evening yes your the sub, the difference between subjective and ob, ob, objective approach is very simple subjective approach is from a personal point of view when i write pain for example if i take the topic pain then i'm going to write about pain in my way of expression so that is subjective where i take my perspective and give it to literature when it is objective i'm going to treat pain as a device i'm going to think of pain as one of the emotions of human mind and it's going to be universally acceptable so when i talk about pain and if you have to comprehend what pain i am going to talk about then i should have an objective approach to it by saying that pain is a feeling that everybody undergoes now that is objective pain is what i feel from the depth of my gut now that is subject when i express my own ideas with a subjective element with my perspective it it's subjective when it is given to the world taken away from me as a as a common idea or a thought or a common literary device that is called as objective approach in literature yes right next we have a question from deepa pv that what is the basic difference between hermeneutics and phenomena phenomenology yes, phenomenology yes hermeneutics is nothing but you take a text and analyze literary components for example all the new critics like i a richards um, like um, richard richard uh, i a richards and uh, stephen leacock all these people what they did was they took a literary text and they literally analyzed it or they if you if you call it Uh, they dissected the entire literature into parts of literary text and they understood the literary devices that they used they they understood the knowledge the interpretation and the branch of, of knowledge how they perceived it through the text so it is more like a in depth study is hermeneutics but when it's phenomenology it's a psychological interpretation of what was the writer's point of view how could he perceive or how could that particular person perceive that idea that is called as uh, phenomenology but when you take a literary text and then you subdivide it into techniques styles uh, um, semantics all these compartmentalized ideas that is called as hermeneutics yeah i hope you're answered right very very rightly answered that there is a question by angana and angana says or angana angana says that uh from the women representations in ott platforms per se could we apply phenomenology and symbolism um okay uh, that's a very relevant most modern question or rather say the relevant contemporary question um okay let's take symbolism as an idea uh, symbolism is the moment i tell you an idea of influencer what comes to your mind is that they influence a group of people so now that's is that is a phenom that is the symbolistic act that is happening in the world and we go to instagram and you find people who are called an influencer the first symbol that comes to your mind is they are influencing certain people in that particular topic so yes on ott platforms like movies also when you have um, for example when you see stories if i don't know if you already watched these movies but let me some give you some examples of women representations you you find symbolism of women being feministic or pseudo feministic then you have people who are uh, gender based you know where their uh, their ideas are relevant to the world when they courageously present their ideas to the world so yes it it is there and you can talk about symbolism more than phenomenology phenomenology will come into uh, ott movies like um uh, the f ephemeral movies like you have the um what can i say um yeah you can even talk the suicide squad as a phenomenologistic one 
that is the director had a very eccentric idea of uh, how how these people turn out to be gangsters or you can also think about what you know some new movies or new series that are coming across if it is giving giving a perception of that particular person or a character to the world through their pain and subjective ideas that can come under phenomenology but if they are representing a very bold character for example kangana ranaut when she's trying to take uh, rani jansi's role she's trying to symbolize that women are heroic in that particular uh, particular era so that is symbol but when you take ott platforms where they are talking about personal experiences it can come under phenomenology yeah right uh, may i also request the participants if you directly want to ask any question please raise your hand and i will unmute you and you can directly ask the question you you have one more question here can we consider robinson crusoe by daniel defoe as example of naturalistic constitutive phenomenology no that will come under um, hyper realistic because it it brings a metaphysical idea to it so it doesn't come under naturalistic or at least say at to one point where it's all about war and cowboys and all that it's fine but when it goes to a an idea of imagination then it can be like so so it can be here and there but like i told you all these most modern writings cannot be compartmentalized under the uh, 19th century or 20th century school of movement they were just a uh, substratum for these people to grow so it's totally fine you don't have to compartmentalize them to naturalistic constitutive phenomenology yeah thank you uh, do, uh doma konda you can uh, unmute and you can ask the question sir here just i asked a sim i think it is a very simple question uh, madam can say very easily and uh, how this victorian uh, age victorian age 1 age 2 age 3 influenced uh, especially europe and uh, england economically socially and politically yeah that is my question yeah uh, good question because this victorian age um you should understand that during the reign of queen victoria britain was the most powerful uh, if i could if i could tell you the uh, length and breadth wise territory it was it's an a territory that expanded throughout the world and it became the largest richest and the most powerful empire and like i told you she was also the empress of india so when literature flourished though america was under the british rule though uh, britain literally Uh, took over the entire land you should understand that growth was parallel it was not for one country it was not pertaining to one part of the world it was throughout and as trade flourished socially economically and politically socially we had a lot of isms like marxism uh, like capitalism socialism so that is growth people started identifying what they wanted their rights their voting rights from men to women to gender to gender of all types we had people voicing out so that is a growth uh, economically how did we grow we had trade growing in so we had british flourishing a uh, britain flourishing in uh, terms of wealth they started bringing in a lot of trade and politically people started having personal views from people who were laymen who did not even i mean who did not even have the right to speak they had the right to even ask to people who are capitalists that i have a voice and you should listen through marxism and you have people uh, you who no started speaking saying that i am a woman i am phenomenal and i need my right to it so the whole world in the 19th century late 19th century and early 20th century which is the period of victorian 1 2 and 3 people started talking what they need they started representing courageously and that started giving an overall growth socially politically and economically and you yes. have very uh, in details uh, you had discussed regarding the same in the first slide slide yes of yes. at least uh, i think 15 minutes minutes exactly yeah uh, so thank you uh, we take the i think there are no more questions we take the It last there's one question last by, question yeah. sir by uh, jyoti sharma yeah jyoti sharma what is the significance of portraying blurred or not very clear images of life or scenery in impressionism the whole idea of impressionism is to bring what is there in the mind it is not a photo it is a photographic memory into canvas or writing 
so you cannot bring the real life like images when you try to think of it in a dream or idea you can only bring partly what is there as a vision into canvas on these impressionists they wanted to bring exactly what came to their mind and so not so very clear images could bring an example or could relate to what actually was there in their mind so that is the significance of it sometimes when you have dreams and you want to write about it you will only have a not so very clear picture of it or not not a real life one so that is the importance of impressionism yeah right so uh, with that we come to the uh, conclusion of a very engaging and enriching session i am sure the participants have thoroughly enjoyed it we have thoroughly enjoyed it thank you for your efforts that you have put in in, in preparing this uh, uh, particular lecture and uh, it is people like you cooperation and support of uh, you know people like you all that our uh, lecture series are uh, keep on running for the last uh, two and a half years and please always support us in the form of resource person and uh, participants so that we can move ahead and we can uh, create uh, you know an atmosphere and environment of knowledge sharing and uh, yes, then also creating interest uh, in english literature as a subject on behalf so of like team to... dadwage yes please yeah, um... Yeah, I would like to. Sorry to interrupt you there because I know I don't have much time. I would like to thank you, sir, for giving me this opportunity. Though being a literary city, these sessions actually give a boost to people like us, and it is a hope for future because we want to tell the world that we make a difference. So for people like you, it's a big shout out. Thank you so much, and I also wish you success in all your future endeavors. Yeah. Thank you for your kind wishes. Thank you for your support, and uh, you all belong to this stage. And we people like us are always there to support young, enthusiastic, uh, knowledgeable, uh, voracious uh, readers, scholars like you all. On behalf of Team Dad Voyage, uh, we really thank you for your efforts, for your time. Please take care. Good night. See you soon again on this platform. Good night.